McKenna. I'm the Assistant Director of the Sephardic Studies Program here at UW. Um, and I'm very excited to introduce Ben today. Ben is a third year PhD student um, in the Paul G. Allen School for Computer Science and Engineering here at UW. And he's also an innovator in residence at the Library of Congress. Um, he, in the past, um, he graduated from Harvard College and he was the inaugural Digital Humanities Associate Fellow at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and a visiting fellow in Harvard's history department. Um, there are a couple of other things about Ben, but I feel like I could go on and on and I think I'll just <laughs> wait for, I'll just let Ben start. Um, but the last thing that I wanted to just mention is that um, I've been working with Ben now for about a year on um, the intersection between um, like Ladino and technology and digital humanities, um, kind of all towards the goal of working to make Ladino more accessible to a wider audience. Um, and that involves um, making sure that computers can learn to read Ladino even while humans may not be able to read it yet. Um, so this little event here is also actually very closely related to our upcoming um, Ladino Day event, which I will talk a little bit more about at the end. But the theme for Ladino Day this year is revolutionizing Ladino from the printing press to the smartphone. Um, so Ben's research really lies um, squarely in the middle of all of that. So um, without further ado, Ben, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you get started. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, McKenna. I appreciate the introduction. And thank you all so much for being here. I'm delighted to be able to give this little coffee hour presentation. I will definitely keep this to 20, 25 minutes or so. And please do feel free to drop questions in the chat. Um, and I will circle and certainly circle back to them at the end. Um, yeah. And so just generally speaking, I can give a little sense of the trajectory here. So I'm going to start out with a little bit of motivation just behind the kind of research that I do at this sort of intersection of machine learning and cultural heritage work, then move on to the project Newspaper Navigator that I've been working on now for a little over a year. Um, so I'll motivate for the first phase of the project, which was creating a data set, then move on to a demo of a search application that I launched with the Library of Congress um, two months ago, and then turn really, I think, full circle to the question that we're all interested in asking, which is, you know, how can this kind of work that I do with newspapers intersect with Ladino? And so this works very much in collaboration with my advisor, Dan Weld, in computer science and engineering, as well as the Library of Congress Labs team, um, and of course, the Strum Center. So with that, I'll go ahead and dive right in. So you know, I think in a sense, the question that really underpins my research and so many other disciplines is this idea of search and discovery. And I think it really transcends any one specific field. You know, For the historians in the audience, of course, the question of being able to search or navigate archives or large volumes of material is incredibly important. But from the computer science perspective and library science perspective as well, there's a really rich history of research about how to um, for facilitate people to be able to search over large volumes of information. And so this sort of idea of search and discovery, I think will really underpin the sort of newspaper navigator and the way that this research is tending with Ladino as well. So just to keep it in the back of everyone's minds. Um, for the next uh, like five minutes or so, I'm gonna give a little bit of a uh, personal background with my relationship with this research and how I got interested in it. And um, then I'll turn to Newspaper Navigator proper. So this work that I'm going to talk about for a couple of minutes here was done when I was at the museum um, in 2017 to 2018. And so my personal connection with the, the museum itself is actually through my grandmother, who's a survivor of Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. And so I had actually visited the museum with her in 2007 um, around my bar mitzvah and to do some genealogical research on our family. And we were introduced to this archive known as the International Tracing Service Archive, which is this uh, immense you know, the collection of materials pertaining to victims of the Holocaust. Um, it has about 200 million pages of scanned documents. And um, in a sense, it was never really intended to be an archive. Its primary function was precisely what it names indicates. Um, it was meant to be a tracing service. And um, so it was established immediately post-war with the goal of really facilitating family members or um, you know, friends being able to um, find out the fates of one another and um, also reconnect. And so it started rapidly accruing documentation. And um, over the past uh, you know, 75 years, it's continued in this function. And to this day, you can file what are known as tracing requests with the um, International Tracing Service Archive or through the USHMM as well. And this um, effectively um, is facilitated by what is known as the central name index. And I'm showing the physical central name index here. There are about 13 of these shelves. And so these effectively contain these index cards that are indexed according to phonetic um, name, according to like a custom sound index system. 
but effectively within each one of these drawers, you'll see a whole bunch of um, you know, effectively index cards that map somebody's name to then documents within the constituent collection. And so you can think of this central name index, which has about 40 million cards, as really the, the entry point into um, searching in International Tracing Service, and in many ways serves as sort of a, a finding aid in its own right. And this, of course, is fantastic for the, the goal as posed to help um, process requests on individuals. But of course, for historians or people interested in ac accessing volumes of information in the collection via other dimensions, this is quite restrictive. And so, you know, fast forward a decade later in 2017, I returned to the museum this time through the lens of digital humanities um, and became interested in asking questions around how we could try to process this collection at scale using machine learning. And so, in particular, um, one of my colleagues introduced me to what is known as this, this card guide that the staff at the museum had put together over the, the a decade plus of work at the museum or working with the International Tracing Service to effectively learn how to decode these cards. So this card guide is about, you know, it's many hundred pages in length. You can think about it as an Audubon field guide for birds, but except the birds, it's for this very specific purpose of tracing these cards. And so in effect, in effect the, um, the document layout or structure maps to the documents that it's referring to within the International Tracing Service. And so there's this uh, you know, rich taxonomy here, but in a sense, if we can use some sort of you know, emerging computer vision techniques to infer the different structures on the cards, that actually gives us some real insight into the composition of the archive itself. You know, how many different types of death certificates are there? How many different types of DP cards are there from various people, et cetera? And so the question um, sort of underpinning that work was, can we try to sort these cards? So here are some examples pulled straight from the archive. Um, and so this was the real sort of framing of this question that I worked on a number of years ago. And to ground it in the personal, here are some uh, index cards actually um, of my own grandmother showing a trial she testified in in the 60s in her own sort of camp history as well. Um, but I particularly just wanted to ground this in my own personal experience because a lot of the research that I um, do, I think comes from the perspective of my own genealogical research or research in the capacity of the digital humanities being an end user at these archives and really coming to you know, grips with some of the real limitations of these systems from that perspective. And so my hope with the kind of research that I work on with Newspaper Navigator is really to try to project back solutions to these kinds of problems in a way that actually provide new affordances for the end users of these archives or collections. So with that, let me go ahead and turn to Newspaper Navigator. So Newspaper Navigator is a project that I started in September of uh, 2019, so a little over a year ago. And um, before I go into the specific details, I'll just give some background on the newspaper corpus that it was built on. And so it's built on what's known as Chronicling America, which is this massive database of about 17 million digitized historic newspaper pages um, from across the US. Content is contributed by the state level holders or awardees um, across the country. And um, it's a product of what's known as the National Digital Newspaper Program or NDNP for short. And it's a partnership between the NEH and the Library of Congress. And a couple of salient points, it's all in the public domain, making it this really vast public resource. And moreover, it really supports a great API and bulk data access, which um, not only makes it great for digital humanities researchers or people who are interested in computing with cultural heritage collections, but really I think was very crucial to Newspaper Navigator in the sense that a lot of this uh, work that had been done over the you know, many decades here and making this accessible and also searchable was important for being able to compute at scale. So just to give a sense of the diversity, here's a choropleth map just showing the number of pages per state or territory. Um, right now it covers 47 states plus Washington DC and Puerto Rico. Here's the county level representation. I like this just because it shows the papers are pretty local and also um, just how much of the US is covered. Um, here's the temporal coverage from 1789 to 1963. The critical mass is about 1875 to 1925. That precipitous drop is just because of copyright law and what we know to be in the public domain. Um, but of course, we can think about the collection from a number of different perspectives, one of which, of course, is the number of languages represent or the number of pages by language. And so this visualization is by a colleague of mine, Nathan Yara Savage. And I like this one because it really captures the diversity of chronicling America. And I think also dovetails really nicely into questions um, that we're all thinking about with Ladino. In particular, you know, when we start thinking about trying to process these collections at scale when they um, contain many different languages, the question becomes, you know, how can we come up with approaches that are language agnostic? So 
how can we effectively be sure to not exclude various languages or prefer various languages um, based on the methodologies employed. And so that I think gets answered to a certain extent by Newspaper Navigator through an emphasis on the visual content as opposed to the textual content itself in OCR. And so if you go to Chronicling America, you'll find high resolution digitized images. These are off of microfilm. Uh, but then you'll also find the underlying OCR or optical character recognition representation. If you haven't heard that term before, um, OCR is just a machine learning algorithm that knows how to read the pixelated letters on a scan. Um, so say all the pixelated R's and E's and convert those into text. And so uh, effectively underneath each one of these images, we also have a corresponding text file that contains, um, that allows us to do keyword search over the corpus. And it's localized on the page as well. So if I control F on the page, I'll actually be able to see where a certain word or string is appearing. And so in a sense, there's this uh, dual representation between the image level and then the text level. But OCR really, I think, is uh, incredibly powerful for all its faults in terms of being able to allow us to search over volumes of information. So without you know, keyword search, we'd be limited to manually searching by title or by date which of course would mean reading volume or tons of pages, which is just rapidly becomes intractable. And so the question with Newspaper Navigator really, I think um, is how can we try to do an analogous thing to um, OCR, but for the visual content in newspapers. And so in 2017, uh, Library of Congress Labs team launched this wonderful crowdsourcing initiative called Beyond Words. And the goal was to engage the American public by asking volunteers to draw bounding boxes around this visual content. And so there were five different categories. So photos, illustrations, maps, comics, and cartoons. They were also asked to note down the caption and the artist and indicate the specific category. And um, this crowdsourcing initiative over the past few years has been remarkably successful. It's accrued thousands of these bounding box annotations to date. Um, in fact, it passed the 10,000th annotation mark in this spring, I believe. Um, and so in a sense, beyond just being this really rich engagement opportunity in terms of bringing people to the collections, sort of akin to what McKenna and I are thinking about with bringing people to the Sephardic Studies Digital Library, we can also think about it from the perspective of the downstream data set that's been produced by these volunteers. Here's a quick collage I put together of some of this visual content that volunteers identified, and we can really start to get a sense of how rich this visual content is. I think I had always, always thought of newspapers as a pretty text heavy source, but when we start to look at the visual features, we begin to understand just how rich they are. And so when I encountered Beyond Words, this sort of resonated with me. And so when the call for concept papers came out for the Innovator in Residence program at the Library of Congress, my mind really jumped to this, one in terms of just how rich it was, but also because there was this immense data set that could perhaps serve as some sort of training data for training a machine learning model to learn how to do this process itself. And so the question behind Newspaper Navigator to borrow some language from the digital strategy at the library was, you know, could we throw open this treasure chest that is Chronicling America by training a machine learning algorithm to process it at scale? And so once we have this derivative uh, data extracted, which we call the Newspaper Navigator data set, how can we then reimagine searching over this collection? And so the idea here is really to try to facilitate research in a number of different fields. So computer science for my dissertation research, but also library science and the digital humanities. And of course, in this case, Jewish studies as well. And then also try to engage the public and enable a wide range of creative computing and public humanities projects as well, and try to have a very intentionally outward facing role with this project. So the idea behind this machine learning model is if we feed in pages, hopefully we can train this um, fine tuned object detection model. If my apologies of words, if I say words that don't make any sense, happy to return to them and it's my fault only. Um, but if we feed in these pages, hopefully we'll get a machine learning model that knows how to draw these bounding boxes. So say identify all the photos and comics and cartoons on the newspaper page and categorize them as such on the fly. So then we not only get where the visual content is in terms of these bounding boxes, but we also get this pretty rich taxonomy coming back as well. Of course, it won't be perfect, but we can at least try to quantify this by standard machine learning sort of metrics. And so then we can use this trick of going into this underlying OCR representation. Remember, it's localized on the page. And we can then extract all of the textual content falling within each bounding box. So for, say, the photos, we can hopefully get back out captions. For the headlines, we'll get back the underlying headline itself. And then this way, we all of a sudden have some additional textual metadata for all these bits of visual content. So we have not only the visual content, but captions. And so I'm going to breeze through what this looks like in terms of training in the interest of time, but definitely happy to return to this. So in machine learning these days, there's this paradigm known as pre-training and fine-tuning. And so in our case, we utilized 
um, uh, and what's known as Detectron 2, basically Facebook AI research has a number of these open source models available online that are already really good at doing um, object detection, which I'll touch on in a second. And so then the paradigm here is we take this system that's already been trained to do this very broad task on an immense data set. We then feed it a more specific granular data set related to what we're interested in, in this case, the beyond words annotations. We then train it for a little longer with some additional annotations here. And then it effectively learns how to do the task that we're interested in. So the intuition here is that um, for object detection, which some of you may have heard of, it just refers to machine learning algorithms that when fed in an image, not only identify that there's say a dog or a bicycle or a truck in the image, but also knows how to draw a bounding box around it, that there's really this natural resonance between doing the thing on the left and then also drawing a bounding box around say an advertisement on a newspaper page. And so this natural resonance is what's being exploited in this pre-training and fine tuning paradigm. So the idea is if something really is, uh, this model is really good at identifying these dogs and images in a really wide diverse range of objects and images, by feeding it the beyond words annotations, it'll be able to generalize and learn the very specific task we're interested in pretty quickly. So it's computationally efficient and it'll perform pretty well. And so once we have this trained model, we effectively just feed in pages and we get back out predictions. So let me talk a little bit about what this looks like when we run it at scale. And um, I emphasize this too, because I'll be doing something similar very, very shortly with the Ladino newspapers as well. So for each newspaper page in Chronicling America, we of course have the image and then also the underlying OCR. We can then run this visual content recognition on the page and extract out all the visual content that we want. Then we can also go into the underlying OCR to extract relevant textual metadata. We can generate what are known as image embeddings. I'm gonna gloss over this, but more than happy to return to it. And then lastly, we can save all of this. And this is really just a pipeline for processing a single page. So then if we can scale this up, and then do this across the entire corpus, we'll have a derivative data set that hopefully represents it at scale. And so running the pipeline, we were able to process about 16.368 million pages. At the time, this represented about 99.998% of the available pages. Um, one of the challenges here was definitely the scale of data. We were looking at about 100 terabytes of image and XML data. And so accordingly, this required some um, pretty heavy computation. And so we were able to utilize um, some AWS cloud computing. There, their systems are inscrutably named, but this is 96 CPU cores and eight NVIDIA GPUs. So in total, this is uh, about five years of computing time for parallelized across these 104 different machines. Um, all the pipeline code is in Python and it's all available. I'll touch on that in a second. But really quickly, I just want to give a sense of the kind of downstream research questions that um, people that might be of interest to historians or digital humanities practitioners within the context of Newspaper Navigator. So here is a visualization showing all the maps identified from 1861 to 1865 with high confidence. And these turn out to be pretty much maps of the Civil War. And so I like this because it offers some provocations, not only in terms of what um, Civil War historians might be interested in, but also from the perspective of the history of cartography. And you might even notice that a number of these uh, maps are reproduced in many different places in this image. And that's because they haven't been identified redundantly by the model, but rather some of these maps would appear in the same newspaper in multiple different um, issues, or of course would appear in multiple different titles as well. And so sort of akin to the viral text project by uh, Brian Cordell and David Smith, we can really start to infer the social network structure of what visual content is appearing where, where and this gives us a sense of really this uh, sort of viral nature of the press in the 18th or 19th century as well. And of course, we can sort of expand this across the entire data set. Um, some brief notes about the resources for the project. Um, the full data set's available online at news-navigator.labs.loc.gov. Um, you can query it to compute against it using HTTPS and S3 requests, but we also really tried, tried to democratize access here through what we call prepackaged data sets. The idea being there's no coding necessary. If you want all of the maps from 1871 or all of the uh, photos from 1912, you just punch in a certain uh, URL and you get back a zip file with all the images and you also can get metadata in JSON or CSV format. In the GitHub repo for the project, we have all the training data formatted, um, all of the, some tutorials and Jupyter notebooks for how to use the model, how to train it, and also the model itself is available for download. And then lastly, we have a white paper on this research that we actually just presented at the Conference in Information Knowledge and Management as well. Um, and all of this is in the public domain. This was very much per the mission of the Library of Congress, which is to make sure that all the resources from the data set to the code are available and reusable. And um, our goal is really to hopefully see a lot of longitudinal usage here. And in fact, I think this dovetails well into this 
um, work that I'm doing under my Jewish studies fellowship here, which is reusing a lot of the code that I've produced in the context of Newspaper Navigator last year for the purposes of processing a different newspaper corpus. In our case, of course, many different new Ladino newspaper titles. Um, very briefly, I just wanna mention that of course, machine learning is pretty fraught in many different ways in terms of perpetuating uh, marginalization, oppression, and can really be a source of erasure for entire communities. And so to think through these kinds of um, critical aspects of data and machine learning in particular, I wrote what I call a data archaeology in which I trace the uh, digitization pipeline flow for four different reproductions of the same image of W.E.B. Du Bois as shown here um, from Black Newspapers and Chronicling America. I'm happy to drop the link into the chat as well. But um, this is just a resource to try to think through some of the more science, technology, and society um, studies angle to this work. Um, but very briefly, you know, to speak about how this all relates to my dissertation research, um, you know, once we have all this derivative data, how do we search over it? And so this is a pretty, I think, a well-studied and you know, has a long history within computer science and library science. And so my work is just sort of extending this idea of exploratory search. And we launched what, uh, the search user interface for about one and a half million photos from the data set. Um, the idea here is to really try to empower users to train what we call AI navigators to retrieve visually similar content. I'll show a demo in a second. Um, the idea here very much is to expose the machine learning training to the user, make it interactive. And um, in so doing so, we've made it possible to train and predict on all one and a half million photos in just a couple of seconds. And so here, we're really trying to make this iterative and empower the user to be able to search for the kinds of visual content that they're interested in. And so to give a sense of what this looks like, let me go ahead and go to the, the platform that we launched. Um, here it is. So this is um, uh, news-navigator.labs.lock.gov slash search. It's been launched for a couple of months. And I very briefly just want to demo what this AI navigator looks like in terms of the new affordance that we're providing. So I'm going to go ahead and do a quick keyword search. I'm going to put in baseball, just my, my go-to. Um, and right now we're doing a sort of standard keyword search where we're getting back 5,400 images whose captions contain the word baseball. And so, you know, they're sorted chronologically here, but we can start to see, of course, the limitations of keyword search. We might get team photos back or portraits or action shots or even photos of stadiums which um, some of which might be interested to you, some um, might not. And of course, we'll be missing all sorts of images whose captions contain things like baseball, or excuse me, like Yankees or Babe Ruth or something, but not the phrase baseball. And so these kinds of limitations start to, you know, in, ask us or press us to think about other ways of searching. So I'm just going to show a very quick demo on how to search for action shots of baseball players using this newspaper navigator, AI navigator affordance. So. I've selected a few images of sort of action shots of baseball players. So now I'm going to go to this tab to train my AI navigators. My sincere apologies if I'm going very fast here. I just want to make sure I have ample time to talk about the Ladino connection and do questions too. Um, but right now we're finding on the right all of the visually similar images to this one selected on the left. And so we can see that we're getting some baseball players. They're not perfect though. Um, this one's actually doing a pretty good job. But I'm going to go ahead and select all of these examples that I've selected here. I'll call this baseball. And then I'm going to click train my AI navigators to retrain on all of my selected examples. And we see that, OK, we're getting some that are relevant, some that aren't. And so we can go ahead and say, I'd like less like these examples that aren't related to baseball and more like the examples that are related to baseball. So I'll train this one or two more times just in the interest of time. So while I click this retrain button, it's predicting on all one and a half million images and resorting. So we see we're getting more baseball players. Um, and I will probably abandon this in one second, just in interest of getting back to the slide deck. But effectively, we can continue this process and the system should continually learn and identify images of baseball players. OK, so we're doing better. And the idea here is that now we're getting back images of baseball players that we never would have found through caption search. So now I'm back to the demo. And now let me, of course, return to the central question here to tie it full circle, which is how can Newspaper Navigator help us study the Ladino press? And so this work is in collaboration with Devin as well. And um, just very briefly, I want to ground this in Lavara, which of course is a prominent Ladino newspaper. And um, here's a page from 1930, and I've zoomed in on it. And you know, I think the Ladino is particularly interesting for a number of reasons from the perspective of OCR and machine learning, primarily is because there's this sort of challenging question of how we OCR Ladino newspapers, given that the Hebrew Rashi script is interpreted by all these OCR engines as Hebrew and then just entirely botches the language. And so 
in a sense, I just want to tie this back to some of the questions surrounding machine learning and erasure. And of course, all of these OCR engines prioritize various languages like English um, for all sorts of proprietary or non-proprietary reasons. But we can really see how this is embedded in the underlying algorithms where we're then losing the ability to say um, OCR, Ladino newspapers or other newspapers or texts of Ladino languages. And there's been a lot of really interesting critical work in this space. But I just want to just use this as a reminder that machine learning and the decisions about what they're trained on are never made impartially and have downstream impacts across the board. And so from the perspective of you know, my research, um, and we've spoken with Devin over the years and trying to think through some of these limitations, it became clear that maybe one way to answer this is to actually not think about the Ladino newspapers specifically from the perspective of OCRing, but rather try to leverage this really rich visual content that's appearing in the Ladino press. And so here's an example on the left here, right? We see all these rich advertisements and photos, and here's another page as well, um, where we have some cartoons and illustrations. And so the work that I'm currently doing with Devin and uh, have some stuff running on uh, you know, a cloud computing thing right now is to basically ask, you know, how can we instead try to study the Ladino press at scale by not looking at the actual text and OCRing it directly, but rather trying to extract these large volumes of image content or visual content and then reimagine searching over them very akin to how I showed in that newspaper navigator search app demo. And so given that there is this very uh, explicit bottleneck in terms of really being restricted to manually reading the pages, this is perhaps our initial lens into really studying thousands or tens of thousands of these pages at a time. And so this I offer without any like, very, very concrete results yet. So my apologies about this being a bit of a cliffhanger, but if you check in with me throughout the course of the year, please feel free to do so. Happy to give updates. I'll be giving uh, you know, presentations within the Jewish Studies uh, Graduate Fellowship cohort as well. Um, but very briefly, before I turn over to questions, I just want to say that I have an enormous number of people to thank for this work across many different institutions at the library, my advisor, Dan Weld, and then, of course, um, Devin McKenna and everyone at Jewish Studies here. And um, just very briefly, this work is supported by an NSF Graduate Research Fellowship, the Library of Congress Innovator in Residence Position, and the Richard Wilner Memorial Fellowship. And with that, I just want to say thank you, and please feel free to reach out to me. Here's my email address. I can drop it in the chat as well. But always happy to talk more about this or other questions.